Hello and welcome to this audio and visual representation of day three at the Darwin Festival. I was very lucky to get the opportunity to go to Shrewsbury School to take a look at their Darwin collection in the library. I also got to visit the Taylor Library, which is the original library from the original Shrewsbury School. Now, we weren't just left to our own devices and to, to roam around and get our sticky fingers on books uh, from, you know, the you know 1500s. No, we had our expert guides, which were Dr. Robin Brooksmith and Naomi Nicholas, who you'll see and hear on this later on. I must add, before we go any further, that Shrewsbury School did give me permission to use my camera as long as I didn't obviously capture any children. It's a school, after all, we've got to protect the kids. And I must commend the two gents who stopped me on my way out. Uh, you see, they'd taken off our visitor badges before we left this, um, the site, um, before we could leave. So this, the two guys just saw me an odd guy walking around with a biscuit t-shirt and a camera in hand they challenged me and asked me why i was walking around the school with a camera after I explained who i was and what i was doing they were fine but well done lads uh, you did the, the right thing uh, that anybody should do if you see a strange guy in a biscuit t-shirt walking around the school with a camera moving on our first stop for the tour was in the moser gallery which is situated inside the library now while we had these experts here with us during our time there, I didn't want to record everything I saw because apart from it being rude, it kind of spoils a little bit for anybody that may want to go on a tour in the future. The next voice you're about to hear is Dr. Robin Brooks Smith, who is the Taylor librarian and the archivist at Shrewsbury School. He, he was um, t typical, you know, wasn't paying attention. And he, uh, there's a picture of a soldier, a wonderful soldier, in his uniform. Um, he's practicing his signature, he's practicing italic letters and upright letters, uh, he's drawn stick men and so on and so forth. So he was an ordinary everyday schoolboy and he came into the school right at the bottom and moved very, very slowly up the school, wasn't particularly distinguished, uh, um, didn't do particularly well, showed very little academic aptitude and wasn't very interested in the mainly classical curriculum that the school had at the time, mainly classics a bit of geography and a lot of um, uh, divinity, scripture, religious study. And they had to, the, the school chapel for 300 years, it was down in the old school in what's now the public library. The chapel was in fact St Mary's Church. And they, on, they had to go every day to, to um, chapel and three times on a Sunday they had to go. Um, and uh, he, he reckoned that he, they had to learn bits of Latin off by heart. He reckoned he could, he, he'd have the book under the pew in the chapel. He reckoned he could learn it during the chapel service in time to be able to recite it. The next voice you're going to hear is Naomi Nicholas. And I think she was absolutely fantastic in how animated she was. She'd really bring the audience in when she was expl explaining what a particular item was, whether it be a letter or a book. Uh, she was really good at bringing people in. I thought she was fantastic a great letter writer. There are many collections of his writings. Um, Cambridge University has some, Down House have a lot, but I particularly like ours because I think they're very personal. And it's, um, there's lot, we have letters which he writes about scientific matters, but we've got quite a lot of personal letters here that he's writing to his best friend, his childhood friend. They were at university together, they were at Shrewsbury together, and he's called Charles Whitley. And so a lot of these letters are written to Charles Whitley, and they really um, give a sense of Darwin as a you know, human being, of being very self-aware of his own failings, and show him in a quite a romantic-ish light over here. But um, the first one I really want to show you is this letter here, written in 1828. Darwin was uh, 19 years old. He just had his two years at Edinburgh University, struggling through studying medicine, struggling through those, um, not attending his lectures, going off to learn taxidermy instead down the road. That's what got a stuffed crocodile on display here. He didn't stuff it, but I thought it would add to the display there. So here he's writing. Um, before he could get into Cambridge, he had to pass a mathematics exam, and it wasn't, it wasn't his thing. So his father sent him to a tutor, sort of a crammer, in the summer of 1828. And this letter here is written on Sunday evening in August 1828 to his dear friend Whitley. And he writes, uh, My dear Whitley, I am as idle as idle can be. 
And one of the causes you have hit on is, is resolution. The other is being made fully aware that my noddle is not capacious enough to comprehend mathematics. Beetle hunting and such things, I grieve to say, is my proper sphere. He knew he didn't want to study maths. He knew he didn't want to be a doctor. He wanted to learn about the natural world. And if any of you have written, uh, read his autobiography, there's a description there where he's beetle hunting in the woods and he finds a great, oh, there's some wonderful beetles and he runs out of hands and pops ones in his mouth to keep it safe. So indeed, he really, he really loved beetles and wasn't squeamish about them. So right now, um, in Shuzu School, they have this amazing archive of letters, um, pictures, and even two original um, first editions of the Origin of Species, um, one of which is just behind me on the table there. This place is amazing. There's so many amazing things to look at. Um, so I'm going to go and read some of the things and learn. Some learning. Now, as we're about to move on to the next part of the tour, I have to explain. I'm having a good look at things, but really, I, I, I'd like to sit in there for a good few hours and have a good nose at things. But obviously, yeah, we can't do that. But it was really nice to see all these things. So now we're going to go into um, the ancient library, which um, which Charles Darwin may have used. Books may, may have been used by him in that library. So, and of course, what I meant by ancient library, which it is an ancient library, but what I really mean is the Taylor Library we're about to enter right now. And the library is almost as old as the school. Uh, it was established in 1596 when the, the original school was completed, the construction of the original school was completed, um, and the, uh, which is now the public library, and the library was the upstairs floor on that wing that goes out sideways from the main. And you can still see the names carved on the wall if you go into that part of the library. Um, just as a little funny aside, uh, Incredibly, we have school, we have records of the school accounts going back to 1577. They're handwritten in Latin, beautifully written. And we have an account from a chap called Redman, who was a stonemason, who cut stone in Grins Hill, and he carted it in to, for the construction of the original school, which is now the library. So he paid for the stone and the carting, and also timber from Harnage for the scaffolding. And it's just wonderful to have this handwritten account of the, of the original library. But these shelves, these piers here all the way around, um, go back to, is it the early 18th century? Yes, early, about 1720. 1720. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would have been in the library, and these would have been the shelves that Darwin would have um, uh, perused books. Um, the, uh, what, what we've done today is to put out a, a, a dozen or so uh, scientific books that would have been available to Darwin if he read scientific books, and I'm sure he did. Uh, but to give you an idea um, of, of the sort of books that were, were on display then, um, the uh, Taylor Library, it's called the Taylor Library because an old boy of the school who was a day boy, lived in the town, went to school when it was you know, in the, in the original building became a very successful classicist and became professor of classics at Cambridge and a fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. And he became, eventually, he was a great book lover and he collected books, all sorts of rare books and wonderful books. And he became the Cambridge University librarian for a time. And when he died, he bequeathed all his books to us, not to Cambridge, which we were rather pleased about. Um, and the keeper of special collections there, William Hale, is in touch with me from time to time and he's asked me to speak about the Taylor Library over there. Uh, four or five years ago they were having an exhibition on Taylor and he said there's seven, about seven books on Taylor that I'd like information on. Can you tell me this, that and the other and can you give me some images of the title page and the book plates? And Taylor's got a particular book plate which is sort of two um, stags and, and, and the coat of arms and all the rest of it. Six of these seven books had Taylor's book plate, and the seventh had Cambridge University Library. 
<laughs> 70, 30 or 20 or something. So I said nothing and he said nothing. <laughs> um, so we, we were in due course introduce you to the science book, but Naomi would like to um, talk a bit more about... Yes, which we've all seen here um, that we have a small area of the original chained library left. This is how uh, the books would have originally been stored, um, with their four edges outwards like this, and titles inked on the spine. Um, all of them would have had a little hook like this to keep them safe and absolutely chained and secure and safe, because books were rare, um, it was unusual. Um, it wasn't until about the mid-1730s that the uh, way of storing changed almost across the world as well, and we followed suit, and so books were turned round and displayed as you now see them. But it's lovely that we've got a little area like this left um, with the original. And of course, these are the original bookcases, you say that, from the town library as well, so they came up with us here. Um, so we've got mostly Bibles and Bible commentaries on this pier here. There's a lot of history and classics, um, a collection of science books all bequeathed to us by two Shrewsbury doctors or on those two final piers over there. Um, we have a fine collection of printed press books um, just facing you there. And do look on the way out that we've got a Kelmscott press display on either side in the two cases when you come in the door. Um, we've got lots of books about Shrewsbury as well around the corner. And as Dr. Brooke Smith said, we've put some of the scientific books out um, and some two atlases as well, which we hope, you never know, might have inspired Darwin in some way. So do go and look at that. And also the wonderful collection of fine bindings in the glazed cabinet over there in the corner. Yes. Thank you. Um, if we go and move through here, what we've got over there, by the way, um, um, is uh, two rather wonderful things. One on the left is... Um, what's called the herbarium, which is pressed flowers from the Oxford Botanical Gardens from uh, 1670, something, 1670, I think. Yes, uh, 1670. So those are, those are pressed flowers from 300, 300 years ago. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, Some of them with their original colour as well. We've got uh, about seven total volumes of, of herbarium, uh, and they were used for medicinal purposes. Um, and who knows, it was in here when Darwin was at school, he might have opened it and looked at the samples. And the other is a, um, a herbal, isn't it? A, a description of the medicinal uses of wildflowers and so on. Here we have um, an atlas by Ptolemy, uh, from Geographia. Uh, and it's a very interesting item, this, because it was originally produced by Ptolemy, who lived in the first century AD. Um, and it was based on a, a lot of it on the explorations of the Greek explorer Pythias in about the third century BC. Uh, and he produced this. It, well, it wasn't an atlas; it was a series of maps. The atlas was invented in the sort of 15th, 16th century as a great idea with the arrival of printed books of, of sticking maps together and calling it an atlas from Charles Atlas, who holds up the world. So you, you, you have a collection of, of maps uh, together in one bound volume. Um, and uh, the, 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 the original Ptolemy Geographia was lost for a thousand years, was completely not known, and was just re, re found or rediscovered in the 15th century in Italy, which was very much like what was happening in the Renaissance of old classical documents were being rediscovered and, and classical learning, that the Renaissance was the sort of rebirth of classical learning. And here it is printed and um, I'll leave it open at the United Kingdom and you'll see, or the British Isles, and you'll see how um, accurate or not accurate it was. <laughs> um, and uh, I think the best thing is if you wander around and I'll explain yes. books as, as um, Britain. Um, yeah. yeah. If you, if we, you get a slightly different perspective on it if you turn to France. And there's Albion Insulae Britannicae, part, part of the British Isles of Albion. Uh, I don't know that well, they've got the Isle of Wight, right, haven't they? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you get the Pyrenees and the Alps, ah. just a sort of rough yeah. sketch, you know. Yeah, mm. fascinating. But, but for wow. BC, it's pretty good, really. Mm. Mm. And, and the whole world, if you want to look at the whole known world, um, there you have it. Oh, India has vanished. But Sri Lanka, <laughs> obviously the, the ships got that far, and Saudi.
Just to be in this room was really, really special. I got to walk around and be surrounded by all of this knowledge and this history. And I also had these two experts here to speak to, and we did. We had some great conversations about um, some of the books and, and the history. So just to be in this environment, for me, as a person who isn't an academic, was really, really special. I spoke to a lady who told me about the, the smell of the books, the old smell, and I, I, I couldn't help but agree. I mean, when you go to a, a place like this and you smell the, the old books, or even if you're in an old church or, you know, I went to Venice and I got to go into the, the, the churches and the old buildings there, that musky old smell, it's probably about as immersive as history can get. And I can't help but feel in awe of, of being surrounded by this. And for the audio listeners that can't see what I'm trying to describe, there are literally shelves upon shelves of books that go from the floor right to the ceiling. Some of the more rare books are encased in glass cases so you can still see them, but obviously they need to be protected. A guy came up to me and was like, oh, it's weird to see radiators up by the ceiling. But of course, these books, they need to be kept up maybe a perfect humidity. Maybe, you know, these books are protected so much that the temperature in the room is of that important. There are busts on the bookcases. There are, there are little mementos of, of some of the geniuses, some of the scholars that would have fingered through these books years and years ago. There's even on one side a death mask of Oliver Cromwell, which I found fascinating. I'd heard that death masks exist, but I'd never actually seen one in real life. This room is a treasure trove for fans of history out there, the people that enjoy learning about history. Just to be in that room was a real honour. While we see ourselves out of here, I want to say a huge thank you to Shrewsbury School for putting on this amazing tour. To our amazing guides, um, Dr. Robin Brooksmith and to Naomi Nicholas. You guys were fantastic and um, there's always an open invitation for you guys to come sit with me on the biscuit and just talk history. I would love to do that with you guys. I also want to say thank you for letting me do my biscuit thing, take some pictures, videos and stuff. It was a real honour to be able to capture this place because not everybody gets to come in and see the school. Um, it's not a public place. You can't just walk in and start taking pictures. So it was a real privilege. So thank you very, very much. This has been a real pleasure to put together. And please, if you enjoyed this, make sure you give the Shrewsbury Biscuit a subscribe on YouTube, a follow on Podbean, um, you get listening to some of the podcasts and give us some support. We love doing what we do and uh, we will be back to do some more. Thank you very much. Peace out.